So uh, take a look. We got to Perik Lamed Beis, Pasuk Lamed Beis, 3232, uh, page 914. And this is, uh, yesterday we are speaking about the... Uh, we got the Bnei Gad and the Bnei Ruvain. How they wanted to go into uh, into Eretz Israel, and um, they end up getting this portion in the land of Israel. And then, if you look at Pesach thirty-two, eight lines from the top. So finally, the Bnei Gad and Bnei Ruven, they say, Nachnu Navor Chalutzin Lifnei Hashem. Everybody see where that is? Three lines, uh, eight lines from the top. And 914. Nachnu Navor Chalutzin Lifnei Hashem. We will go in. We will cross over. Art's called translate Chalutzin, armed, because they're going to be fighting the war. Nachnu Navor Chalutzin Lifnei Hashem. Eretz Kenan, into the land of Kenan. And we'll have our portion on the other side of the Jordan River. So uh, the Mephorshim, uh, we, we spoke yesterday about their flaw earlier, that they kept talking about they're going to do this and they're going to do that and they're going to do the other without mentioning Hashem, which sounds like the, uh, the standard kochi votes and yodi, that we're going to do it on our own. And finally they say, okay, we're going to go into the land of Canaan before Hashem. We will go in Lifnei Hashem, in the presence of Hashem. So the Mephorshim explained that there are two things that the Jewish people were given. The Jewish people are given the Torah, and Jewish people are given the land of Israel. And the land of Israel is not a, the, the, the Torah was given in the desert, because uh, we've mentioned this in the past, that the Jewish people are not Jewish because of a land. We're the only people, Italians are Italians because they come from Italy. And uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, uh, um, um, Afghans. Afghans are Afghans because they come from guess where? Afghanistan. You're on a roll, baby. They come from Afghanistan, right? So, so everybody is. You are what you are because of where you come from. Except Americans, because American is a, is an artificial country. America was just a melting pot. But everybody else is coming from somewhere because America was just it was just you know you know you're, 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 you're that's why they, in America you call the Japanese American or a Chinese American or a Jewish American. You know, you're you're but you're an American. It's a melting pot. But before that, every country was based on a nationality. The only ones weren't. The only ones weren't were the uh, were the uh, the Jews because the Jews were not Jews because of Israel. The Jews are Jews because of the Torah. We became a nation because of the Torah. That's why the Torah was given in a desert. That we shouldn't make a mistake and think that we're Jewish because of the land of Israel. We're Jewish because of the Torah. The Torah is what creates our, and that's why Jews, the Torah, the land of Israel, the question is always, should a person live in Israel? Should you live in Israel? It's a good question, right? Should you live in Israel? The answer is, like saying, should you live in Pittsburgh? Right? Or should you live in, uh, in Argentina? The answer is that the deciding factor of where you should live is where is it good for you to grow as a Jew. For some people, for many people, for possibly most people, it's good to grow as a Jew in Israel. For some people, it's good to grow as a Jew in Pittsburgh. Well, maybe not in Pittsburgh, but for some people, it's good to grow as a Jew in Pittsburgh. Some people, it's good to grow, grow as a Jew in Argentina because they have to take into account factors such as finances, family, finances, marriage, finances, uh, a job, finances, and where your in-laws live, right? So you say there, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of factors that go into it. And if for a person to serve God, a person has to be besimcha. A person has to be, uh, simcha, by the way, doesn't mean putting a trampoline on a, on, on a car and jumping up and down with wild music in the background. Simcha means that a person is energized and has uh, focus on growing. So there is no, we don't, we're not Israel thumpers. It happens to be that because of Israel, because there is a Kedusha in Israel, if all else is equal, then you should live in Israel, if all else is equal. But if all else isn't equal, if a person is going to live, and this is something you obviously cannot, there's no what, one size fits all over here. You have to have a, uh, you have to have a mentor or a rabbi who, who advises you, but it's got to be a very, very careful decision because you have to know about schooling for your children and you have to know about finances and everything else that goes with 
being able to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu b'simcha. So if a person is going to live in Israel and he's going to have financial strain and therefore is going to be in a bad mood, he's going to take it out on his wife and his kids are not going to succeed in the Israeli school system, so it's not the place for a person to live. If a person is living in Chutz Laaretz and he has a livelihood and he's got kids are well doing well in school and he's got a community and he belongs to a shul, so then often that's the place and you shouldn't rock the boat. And if it's going well, don't rock the boat. That's why we say in Halal, when we shake the lulav, we shake the lulav at Ana Hashem Hoshiana, right? We say Ana Hashem Hoshiana, we shake the lulav. Because when a person needs a Yeshua, when a person needs salvation, then you got to move around. If you need a salvation, you got a, you got a problem, you got a bad situation. So a person needs, needs to move around and make adjustments. Ana Hashem Hatzlichana, if a person is being successful, you don't move. Leave success, don't, don't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's the attitude. So the first thing that we see over here is, Moshe Rabbeinu represents Torah, because he's the one who brought the Torah down. Who took the Jewish people into the land of Israel? Who brought them into the land of Israel? Yoshua, Joshua, brought them in. So Rashi brings down earlier, Rashi brings down the famous statement from the Gemara, that, from Chazal, that Moshe Rabbeinu's face was like the sun, and Yoshua's face was like the moon. Moshe's face glowed like the sun. You know, Moshe came down from the mountain and his face was glowing. He had even had a pair of mask on it. And Yeshua's face glowed like the moon. That's what the word says. There are chairs. You may bring a chair from the other room. It's a shame to stand up. You won't get there. There, the what do you call it? There's a chair over here. There's a chair over here if you want. So Moshe Rabbeinu, what do you call it? Moshe Rabbeinu's face is like the sun. Yeshua's face is the moon. Now, what that obviously means is Yeshua is Moshe Rabbeinu. Is the, if you know the relationship between the sun and the moon, so obviously the moon does not have light of its own. Light of its own. The moon reflects the sun. Right, the sun. The sun provides the light. It's good. It's good. It's good. Don't worry. The sun. The moon provides the light, and the light is reflected. The moon. That's the sun. Sorry, the sun provides the light, and the moon. The moon reflects the light. That means that Yoshua, who represents the land of Israel, Yoshua is a disciple. The disciple reflects the Rebbe. Moshe Rabbeinu is the Rebbe. Yoshua is the disciple. He is a reflection of the Rebbe. So his light isn't the same. And the same uh, potency as the sun, because the sun is Moshe Rabbeinu. Yeshua reflects the sun. But now let's carry the parallel downwards. Moshe Rabbeinu is Torah and Yeshua is Eretz Yisrael, because he's the one who brought him into Israel. Israel has to reflect Torah. That means when they say, we are going into the land of Israel, we're going to go in, Eretz Canaan. we're going to go into the land of Canaan, in the presence of Hashem. That means our life in the land of Israel has to be a reflection of Hashem, which is the Torah. So a Jew who lives in Israel, to live in Israel without Torah, you're missing the, you're missing the mark. A person has to, the person who can live in Israel, he has to be living in Israel with Torah. Living in Israel without Torah, a person is much better living anywhere else in the world with Torah than living in Eretz Israel without Torah. And therefore, it's always got to be, the land of Israel has got to function on, based on Torah with a Jew uh, uh, being loyal to Torah. That's idea number one. Idea number two is if you go to the next Pasuk, and here is an absolutely mind-boggling idea. Uh, the, the, one of the biggest goals of life, most people would like to live longer than shorter. If you have a choice of living longer or living, living more time or less time, so most people would like to live longer than, than, uh, than, than, than shorter, right? And it's just interesting because sometimes if you go to the bus stops, I was talking to Dave yesterday about, if you go to the bus stops here, so they show you how soon the bus is coming, right? And it says like three minutes. And then about nine minutes later, uh, the bus still hasn't come. And uh, you know, all I'm thinking is, boy, I hope these people time the rest of my life, you know, because, you know, by, by, by their standards, you're going to be living a long time, you know. That's, that's the longest three minutes I've ever seen. So, so the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, uh, most people would like to figure out, I, I heard about this, so there was a 103-year-old, a guy from Switzerland who was 103 years old, and he was still doing cross-country skiing. And they asked him to what he ascribes his long life. And he said, uh, I think he said something like, you know, working hard, um, getting plenty of exercise, and not drinking too much. But then again, not drinking too little. That, that, that's what he said. So I don't know, maybe he's onto something. So, so uh, most people would like that. Now, what can we do to extend our lives? I want to show you something just, 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 just uh, mind-boggling. 
It says over here in Posuk La Megibo, Vayite Le Moshe Liv, they God believe, they Ruven Velachatzi Shevet Menasha Ben Yosef, Es Mamlecha Sichon Melacha Amori. He gives them the kingdom, the land of Sichon, who they had conquered. Ves Mamleches Og Melacha Boshon. In the, the area of Og. Remember the king Sichon and Og were the last two kings that they defeated before going into the land of Israel. Now, Og Melacha Boshon. Does anybody remember how? When's the first time we ever hear of Og in any of the, whether in, this, in, in the written Torah, in the oral Torah, when do we hear of Og? Was it during Noah? During Noah, he was on the outside of the Teva. Og was hanging on to the outside of the ark. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's uh, you better be, have strong arms for that. And he and apparently they had a window for him, and he kept his face in there to be able to breathe. So he didn't know what he called. So Og was the first snorkeler in history, right? He had, he had, he had his face inside the uh, inside the teva, and he was breathing teva, whatever. I mean, the air in the teva wasn't great either. He got a lot of animals in there, but but he, but it's better than the alternative. So the so Og was hanging on to the outside there. That's what the medrash says. Then we find Og again. When he comes back from the battlefront, he tells Avram that Lot was captured. And then we run into Og Melech Abashan again when the Jewish people are going into the land of Israel and then they kill Og. Moshe Rabbeinu the Gabor and Bracha says that Og Melech Abashan decided to pick up a mountain and drop it on the Jewish people. So he picked up a mountain, the Gabor says, and the mountain was then, he was going to drop this mountain on the Jewish people, and then a bunch of ants came and they hollowed out. Apparently he had the mountain on his head. He was holding it up on his head, and he, they hollowed out. They hollowed out the mountain, and then the mountain dropped over Og's head, right? Something you know. So he got loose where he didn't expect. I hate when that happens. And the mountain he dropped over his head, and then he tried to take it off, but his teeth extended into the mountain. So he got like that, pulling off the mountain. In the meantime, Moshe Rabbeinu took a hatchet, and he jumped. Moshe Rabbeinu himself was ten amos tall. It's about fifteen feet. And he was ten amos tall, and he took a hatchet that was ten amos long, and he jumped up ten amos, and he swung the hatchet, and he hit Og right in the ankle. That means Og's ankle was thirty amos off the ground. Dang, yeah. And so I, I, I what do you call? I once made a calculation based on minimal. I had some time. And I made a calculation based on minimal, assuming an am is a foot and a half, so it comes out Og was about four fifths of a mile tall according to that Gemara, based on the, the, the what he called. Now, whether it's literal or obviously there's a, all these Midrashim have to be taken. You know, I want to ask a question. I'll ask you an intriguing question. Is that Medrash true? Is that Medrash that he's that tall, is the Medrash true? Careful, careful. So Rabbi asking a question, you know there's a trick. Right? Is the Medrash true? What do you say, Ezra? Is the Medrash true? Is the me- both? Oh, the Medrash is a hundred. Sign up, boys. The Medrash is a hundred percent true. The question is if it's literal. But there's a difference between something you can say it's not true at all. It's a hundred percent true. The only question is if it's literal or not. And there are opinions that every Medrash has a literal level. There's certainly a <laughs> symbolic level. And the symbolic level is that Moshe Rabbeinu was intimidated by Og because Og had a tremendous merit. Yeah. And the merit that he had was that he came back and told Avram Avinu about Lot being captured. So Moshe Rabbeinu was worried about Lot's merit. That's number one. Number two, the Targum Yonasan Ben Uziel, which is a very, very, uh, from a long time ago. The Targum asked, what did Lot do to merit such long life? Listen carefully, gentlemen, it's a potential life changer. What did Lot do? Now, if you make a calculation, that he was around from the time of the, of, of the Teva until the Jews killed him when he went into the land of Israel. You're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. I don't know exactly how long it is. But you're talking about a, it's a lot of candles on a birthday cake. So, so we're talking about, a, we're talking about a, a, a many, many years. So the question is, what did Og do that he deserved that he earned such long life? So the Medrash, listen to this Medrash. The Medrash says he went to Avram and Sarah, and he said to Avram and Sarah, the two of you are beautiful, like a tree alongside a brook. Do you ever see, they have these birthday cards when you go into Hallmark or any of these other places. They have, the, they have different types of cards. They're the sticky cards, they're the real funny ones with the joke, that sort of thing. And then they have like these soft focus cards, like real, real thoughtful, that sort of thing. Thinking of you. They're, you'll never see the card that says thinking of you. There's always a picture of a horse and a tree and a brook in the background. What's a brook? 
a brook is like a, a little stream of water. You ever see the ice? If it's always a stream, and I, I don't know how the horse got in there, but there's there's a tree and a brook and a stream. And it says something like "thinking of you," right? And then you give it to somebody as a birthday present. And the truth is, I never I don't care if you're thinking of me or what you think of me, as long as there's a check inside, you know. <laughs> but when you, if you're going to buy it for your wife for an anniversary gift, to make sure you get a card. Yeah, it got to be a card, you know. And then then, then if it happens to come with a check or a credit card, she's fine. But 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 it's got to be that thinking of you type of thing. So so Og says to Avram and Sarah. The two of you are beautiful like a tree alongside a brook. For that compliment, he merited long life. Do, 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 do. Right? That means if you build somebody up, if you compliment somebody, if you encourage somebody, if you use your mouth properly, I mean, men are, men are you know, we're kind of resistant to this sort of thing. You know, for us, for men, a compliment is, you know, to, to compliment each other, you get all mushy. You know, we, we don't do that. But to say to the guy, hey, that was a good question he asked in class. Hey, that was, what do you call it? That was very considerate you not to take my chair. Right? There's some, something, something like, what do you call it? It was nice of you to, you know, you know, pay my parking ticket. You know, whatever it is, if you compliment somebody, and by the way, this is especially in home family relationships, you can compliment your mother, compliment your sisters, you can even compliment your father. Right, compliment that, that, that's also mutter. Right, and certainly your wife, your spouse. And because of that, you merit long life. How do you like that? Because he complimented somebody. Got, why was it decreed on him that he's killed by the Jewish people? Because he said to Avram and Sarah, the two of you are beautiful like a tree alongside a brook. What does that mean? What does what mean? Why did you say that? that I, guess he was, I guess he wanted to compliment them. So he said, the worst compliment ever. Really? If you told me I was beautiful like a tree alongside a brook, I'd say thank you. I'd say, really? <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> that was the reason he merited long life. Right? If you tell me I'm beautiful like the tree, not the horse, like the tree alongside the brook, I'd say, wow, thanks. Hey, I didn't know you cared. But at the end of the day, he gave, listen, just listen, 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 listen. He gave them a compliment and therefore merited long life. In the next line, he said to them, you're beautiful like a tree along the, but you don't produce fruit. And for that dig, which is where men really come in, because we're good at digging, for that dig was decreed on him that the Jewish people are going to kill him. So the lesson here, again, is where, how one uses their mouth. And there's a pasuk in Mishli that says, Maves v'chayim biyad halashon. The tongue carries the potential for life and the tongue carries the potential for death. Not only what we do to other people, not only what we do, what we could do, we kill other people, but it, it, it carries the potential of life and death for ourselves. One second, hold, hold for one second, I want to go on with this, and then we'll get to the questions. Now, look further. That's what it says about, that's what it says about, about Lot. Now, about Og, sorry, sorry about Og, sorry, sorry, about Og. Now, go further, right to the end of the Parsha. And here, on page 916, it talks about the Jewish people taking over these areas. Now pay attention very carefully. It says, V'yair ben Menashe, Holach v'yilkod eschavoseya. Yair, the son of Menashe, conquered, captured. How does the Arts go translate? Chavoseya, villages. I was going, okay, villages. Vayikra esen chavos yair. Yair captured a certain amount of villages from these, this area that the Jewish people, had, what do you call it, had taken over. And he named it chavos yair, the suburbs of yair. Or the, uh, uh, the, the art school just transliterates it. Chavos yair means like the, the, the lands of yair. Okay? Then it says v'novach holach vayilkodes kenas. Novach captured kenas ves binoseha. Vayikra la Novach Bishmo, and Novach named it after himself. All right, this is going to be called Novachville. Right? And he Novach captures these places called Novach. And now, you'll notice that there's this asterisk over the hay, because in Hebrew grammar, it should really say there should be a dot in the hay, which is a dugesh, which is an emphasis letter. And it should really say, Vayikra la. When you hear the Balkori read it on the, at the parsha, you should really say, Vayikra la. Novach bishmo. But there is no dot in the hay. Take a look at Rashi. Why is there no dot? Says Rashi, to say right column, second line from the bottom. Eino ma hay. There's no dot in that hay. Why? This name that Novach gave it did not endure. In other words, he called it Novachville, but eventually it was changed. The name didn't, the name didn't change. The, 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 name, the name was changed, right? Like Rhodesia. Right, Rhodesia eventually was changed into 
Zimbabwe, right? So Rhodesia never didn't last. It was Rhodesia, and now today it's Zimbabwe. Why? So Novak was called. It was called Novak, and then it didn't last for whatever reason. It didn't last, and therefore there's no dot in the hay. It's soft. Soft meaning it was soft. It wasn't hard. It wasn't solid. The name didn't last. That's the play meaning. Why didn't the name last? Say the commentaries. The is teaching us a lesson. And what's the lesson? The lesson is that we don't accomplish in life by making some sort of monument. That's not how we make a, an impression and leave an impression in this world by building something out of mortar, brick and mortar. That's not what we're going to make it. What a person leaves behind is his mitzvahs and mice and tov, it's his good deeds. So a person has to wonder, and it's a good question. Stop and think for a second, gentlemen. What would you like? I know it's a, you know, it's a little bit of a, a morbid question. It's not a morbid question. It's a real question. What would you like to have them say about you when they eulogize? What well, person has to say, what, should, what will they say about me when they're giving a eulogy? I knew a guy, by the way. The guy was a real funny guy. They had a family meeting. And they're, they're a bunch of, they were older, a generation older than me. They had like this family get together. And the oldest brother, who was a real comedian, he grabbed the bouquet of flowers, he laid down on the couch, and he closed his eyes. He goes, okay, I want to hear the eulogies, guys. I want to hear what you're going to be saying about me. You know, make it good. And he laid down on the couch, and everybody had to get up and eulogize him like he died. Right? So a person has to think, what would you like to have, like, like to have written on your tombstone? Right? Think about what would you like to think about that. Okay, get ready to have a nice tombstone. And they're going to write something. Now, what would you like to have them write on your tombstone? Oh, wow, you know, he could, uh, you know, he could really put down a double burger. You know, he could, you know, oh, and with a six-pack of beer. Why, you know? And, and, and more than that, more than that, if you ever hear a eulogy, how come they never talk about what the person really lived for? They never, I've never, even by, even by other nations, they never get up and say, oh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Tony, yeah, boy, he really liked cars. You know, he, he, he drove a nice car. They always grope for something like, yeah, well, he once held the door open for a little old lady who was on a respirator. Wow, what a tzaddik, right? Or, or, or uh, you know, he, uh, he, gave, he gave 10 bucks away because, you know, somebody was down and out. They always look for something completely opposite of what a person lived for. Nobody says, yeah, you know, he chased this and he was into drugs and he was really, really gambling was his thing. They never do that. Why not? The answer is because at a moment of death, a person understands what real values are, what's really important. And all the things that a person lived for, suddenly they, suddenly they disappear. So a person, has, they had a, a kibbutz here in Israel, there was a kibbutz, where a guy, there was the baker on the kibbutz was known for his apple cinnamon cake. He had, people were wild over this guy's apple cinnamon cake. And what they did was, on his tombstone, they carved the recipe for this apple cinnamon cake. And so people would come to visit the grave, and they come with a pen and paper. They're like, like, one second, what was that? What was that? That was kind of well, I got, they, okay. Rest in peace, you know. You know. And then now they know that's what that's what he left behind. That's what he left behind. I remember once there was a restaurant in in Yerushalayim called Melech Falafel. It was the king of falafel. And I remember seeing this restaurant and thinking to myself, boy, in the world of truth, I wonder how that cuts it. You know, when a guy gets up there after 120 years. So what did you do? What did you do in your, your, your 70 years on earth? I was the king of falafel. <laughs> All right, you know, put them in the frying pan <laughs> into the hot oil for you. <laughs> That's where you, you understand? I don't, it's not enough error to make falafel. I don't say you can make a live to make falafel. But Melachava, the king of falafel, we can do a little better than that. So what the Torah is teaching us is you don't leave a memorial by building a big building and building a what do you call it? You, may, you left some sort of monument with your name on it. Big deal. Nobody remembers, nobody cares. Your, your eternal, what you leave behind eternally is your mitzvahs and mice and tovah, your good deeds, number one. Number two, does anybody know what the Hebrew word novach comes from? What does it sound like in Hebrew, the word novach? Mitlabesh. What? Mitlabesh. Mitlabesh? No. Novach and mitlabesh, I don't quite make that connection. I, uh, what? 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 <laughs> Nevech, hey Nevech, Novach, we're Novach. Yeah, don't do it when I'm drinking, Ezra. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> what? The, the, a dog barking is Noveach. When a dog barks, it's called it's called Noveach. Right? Oh, what's the significance? What is the significance of Novach and Noveach? So I'll tell you what the significance is. You know, the Gemara says somebody who speaks Lashon Hara. Somebody who misuses their mouth, the Gemara says, 
it is fitting to throw them to the dogs. You ever hear that? Somebody who misuses his mouth is fitting to throw them to the dogs. And if you, I told you, I mentioned to you, a human being, the definition of a human being is our mouth. Because we could use our mouth for good or for bad, just like Og Melech did, and in, 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 in many different ways. In many, there are many different things that it could be. You could use your mouth for falsehood, you use your mouth to insult people, you could use your mouth. You know, I was once sitting at a table, I was once sitting at a table, and I bit my tongue real hard. You ever happen to you? You bite your tongue out, and I get it. It was a good one. You know, it's like sometimes you just kind of like, mm. sometimes it's like a cruncher. It's like, mm. oh. And so I, you know, I'm sitting there like this, and you just start tearing. And there's always somebody that, that when you bite your tongue, you're like, mm. and the other time, like, are you okay? <laughs> yeah, I'm marvelous. I'm great. Yeah, can't you see? No, I'm not okay. So, so I, I bit my tongue, and there was a, for, a former friend of mine was sitting at the table. And uh, I bit my tongue, and I went, mm, mm, mm. After I, I just said, well, I guess it must be because of Lush and Hara. So this guy goes, well, not necessarily. It could be lying, insulting people, embarrassing. He went through a whole list of possible, which is why he's a former friend. <laughs> he went through a whole list. Now, if a person understands, when, when, when you, 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 the, the, an animal, a human being, is defined by our mouth. There is no animal in history, believe it or not, by all surveys and studies, not one animal in history is recorded as ever spoken Lashon Hara. No tiger in history has ever insulted anyone. He's ripped things apart, but he hasn't insulted anyone. No giraffe in history has ever embarrassed anybody. Ha ha, shorty. Nobody, yeah, nobody in history, no animal in history has ever embarrassed. Because an animal doesn't have a mouth. He's neutral. A human being who uses his mouth incorrectly is worse than an animal. Because animals don't use their mouth incorrectly. So here's Novach. And now look what it says. Vayikra la novach, right at the end of the Pasuk. <laughs> what does Lamed Hay stand for, gentlemen? Lashon Hara. Vayikra la novach bishmo. There's an allusion here. Lashon Hara, barking. And there's a, there's a, there's a, 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 a what do you call it? There's a, 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 a source that says a person who speaks Lashon Hara could be reincarnated as a dog. A dog. I don't know, you may get your choice which kind, but it's still not a good thing. And by the way, in reincarnation, I mean, if I was, you know, well, never mind, but in, 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 re, in reincarnation, somebody in Shear said they have a Rottweiler. You know, that sounds like a good one. You know, you're usually on top of the heap. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, when a person is reincarnated, and sometimes people think, oh, I just experienced deja vu. <gasps> you know, people say, you know, deja vu is, I'm not sure, but people say deja vu, oh, maybe that's reincarnation. I don't think, I think that's more likely to be drug flashback than, than reincarnation, or that somebody just didn't get enough sleep. On the other hand, if a person comes back as a human being, so then you don't remember your previous life. When a person is brought back as a dog, an animal, which could happen, they remember their previous life. Somebody who's immoral could be brought back as a dog. And uh, as an animal. And when you're brought back as an animal, you do remember your previous life. Remember you were a human being. And now you're trapped in an animal body. And then when you hear a conversation and you'd like to say something and all that comes out is a bark, so they throw you some scraps, right? There's something very humiliating about that. Even more. You want to hear, you want this one, this one will really set your hair on edge. There's a medrash that says a man could spend his whole life accumulating money and then he could die and leave it to his, his what? Dog. His dog. People do that all the time. That they do by choice. He could leave it to his, his son. People don't mind. They do that all the time also. He could end up accumulating money and leave it to his wife's next husband. Oh, yeah, that hurts. Uh, yeah. Uh. Uh, I remember, what's his name? The, the, the what's his name? The guy uh, that, that was going to try to write, become the president, Kerry in America. What's his name? John Kerry. Hey, John Kerry. Do you know who he's married to? Mrs. Henrietta Heinz. You know who Mrs. Henrietta Heinz is? You know, ever heard of Heinz, Heinz Ketchup? Her husband was the owner of Heinz Ketchup. So now Mr. Heinz, his wife ended up marrying John Kerry and paying for his hairdo. Right? For his hairstylist. Remember, here he had that big hair. Right now, if I guarantee you that if Mr. Heinz, Mr. Mr. Ketchup Heinz would have known his wife's going to marry John Kerry, he would have eaten mustard. 
right? <laughs> you know, the last thing he wants, to, so a person, one second gets worse, gentlemen. A person could live his whole life, accumulate money, die, his wife remarries, and then they buy a dog. And the dog is him. And there he is sitting at the table watching his wife and her new husband spend his money. How do you like that? And all he's saying is, burp, 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 and then that's all that happens. He wants to talk, and all he has is a bark. So he has a choice. He can bite the guy. But, but, but assuming he does, assuming he's not a Rottweiler, it ain't going to happen. So you understand, when you're reincarnated as an animal, it's very humiliating because you remember your previous life. The person remembers their previous life. So the lesson, of course, is be good. Uh, that's the lesson. Be good. It's not a good thing to be reincarnated. And by the way, you want to hear something incredible? Do you know that there's a medrash that says that a Isha Tova, Chazal the Gemara says, Isha Tova, Matana Tova Labayla. A good wife is a precious gift to her husband. So the Ben Ishchai says, you know what that means? She's a gift. Why does he call her a gift? Isha Tova, Matana Tova. So we know that a wife, all the blessing in the home, by the way, money, if you have money in the home, it's in the merit of your wife. And if you learn Torah, it's in the merit of your wife. And if you have peace in the home, it's a merit of your wife. You know that? Do you know the Gemara says a man without a wife is without peace? Which is also an intriguing statement. Because I was in yeshiva for a year and a half. I had a roommate, never had any problems whatsoever. I was married for about 15 minutes and already she was telling me what to do. You know, and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> you know, that, 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 that sort of thing. So what does that mean? Without a wife, you're, without a wife you have no peace? I don't know, I was pretty peaceful. Now, Ruben and I never had any arguments whatsoever. Got married, you know. Uh, please don't drop that on the floor. Oh, <laughs> she speaks. <laughs> whoa, you know, you know, whoa, you know, whoa, 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 whoa. And that's only, that's only the little stuff. That's only the little stuff. I wasn't very much at peace. The answer is that's not what peace. The absence of fighting is not peace. Israel and Egypt are also at peace because they don't go to war. That doesn't mean... It's a peace is an actively built, it's something you actively build. Now, the Ben Ishchai says, you ready for this? You know why a wife, a, precious, a wife is called a precious gift to her husband? Because it could very well be that in a previous incarnation, they were married. And the husband messed up. And he had to be brought back. And his wife was okay. But in order to help him get it right the second time, she's sent back down to help him out. So she's a gift. Maybe that's why some of the conversations we have. Sounds like we spoke about this once before. Yeah, it was in a previous life. Right? Oh, can I have your credit card? Oh, you used it up last lifetime already. We're, you know, we're, we're, what do you mean? I cut them up last. I cut them up 400 years ago when we were married. Right? No, no, no. It means that a, a wife can be brought back to help her husband get it right in this world. Now, obviously... A tactful wife, you know, if, I, if they're ever having an argument, I always tell the girls, don't, you know, it's not something to use as, as, as uh, you know, as, as ammunition. A husband and wife are having an argument, and the wife says, you know, I don't really have to be here. I'm only here because of you. <laughs> you know, don't go there, girl. But the, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, a person who speaks Lush and can be brought back as a dog. And therefore, the Torah is putting Lush Elamed Hay right next to Novach. Because Novach means barking, and therefore we have to be very careful how we speak. Page 918. Masse. Parshas Masse. Usually these are a double. In America, by the way, this, is, this week here is a double portion. Matos and Masse, because you guys were behind us by a week. You guys were behind us. Something I think you messed up around Shua's time, right? So now, so now, you're, now you're, uh, you're, you're catching up. Okay. So the Torah says like this. Ela Masse b'nei Yisrael asher yotzu me'eretz mitzrayim l'tzivosa b'yad Moshe v'aron. These are the journeys of the Bnei Israel when they came out of Mitzrayim with their host, Biad, led by, led by Moshe and Aaron. Now, before anything else, before anything else, the Torah then goes on and starts talking about where they went. We'll read that tomorrow. We're going to get to where they went. It talks about all the journeys and what's alluded to by the journey and so on and so forth. But there's one rule here that we see. These are the journeys of the Bnei Israel. Does anybody know what are the first words to the first Jew in history? Who's the first Jew in history? Avram Avinu. And what are the first words to the first Jew? Lech Lecha. Vayomer Hashem el Avram. Lech Lecha. Lech Lecha. Four letters. Four letters. Two words. Four letters. Two words. I'm a Kohen anyway, so I get to do that. Yeah. So four letters. Two words to the first Jew in history. And those two words 
are a description of the entire purpose of a Jew. How do you like that? It's a prediction and a description of what the purpose of a Jew. Lech lecha is said to Avravinu, Elu Masei, these are the journeys of the Bnei Israel. Lech lecha means, first of all, Jews are going to be wandering. Jews are always wandering. The wandering Jew. We're called the wandering Jew. In every Jewish name, every city that you go to, where you guys are from, you're from New York. Where, where, what part in New York are you from? From Brooklyn. From Brooklyn. Which part? Queens? From Queens? Where? Brooklyn. What's that? Some, some from Brooklyn, some from Queens. I've been to Jewish neighbor. I've been to Jewish cities. Been to Denver, Chicago, Cleveland, Philadelphia, Australia. Everywhere you go, when you get there, they tell you, "Oh yeah, that's the old Jewish neighborhood, but this is the new Jewish neighborhood." The Jews they were used to be in the south. Now they moved up north. They used to be in the west. Now they moved the right. And every single Jew, you know why? Lech lecha. Jews are always going to be wandering, even in exile. When we get a little comfortable and you build nice houses and you build nice houses, da, 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 that's right, da, time to move. So it, not only we go to exile from Israel to, to when the base of Egypt is destroyed, we're always, we're perpetually in exile. Just when we think, yeah, we finally found it out, there's the old Jewish, it's always an old Jewish neighborhood. It's unbelievable. They're, oh yeah, that's the old Jewish shul over there. Why is nobody there? Because they all moved north. Why? Because the neighborhood changed. Always, everywhere you go. Lech Lecha is a prediction. That's going to be the fate of the Jewish people. We're always going to be in motion, number one. Number two, Lech Lecha is made up of the same Hebrew words as Lichluch. Lichluch means what? Dirt, filth. That Jews have to learn, move away from filth. Not only a dangerous neighborhood, spiritual filth. Lech Lecha. That's our task in life. Move away from the things that are inappropriate. Move away from the things that are not good. And number three, Lech lecha means go, grow, accomplish something, do something with your life. Lech lecha is the task of a Jew. Judaism is not about remaining stagnant. Judaism, a Jew, is either going up or a Jew is sliding backwards. There is no stationary space for a Jew. Jew does not, there's no such thing as, okay, I am happy, I'm comfortable with my level. If a person's comfortable with their level, that means they're sinking, they're falling back. That's why... If you remember, there's an altar in the Beis HaMikdash. There's a Mizbeach. Does the Mizbeach have steps leading up to it? No. Mizbeach has a ramp. Why does the Mizbeach have a ramp? Because a ramp, an altar in every religion, an altar represents devotion to the cause. Every religion carries with it, certainly the old religions, the ancient religions, there's an altar and there were offerings to some idol or something or other. In Judaism, there's an altar in the Beis HaMikdash. The altar has a ramp. Why is there a ramp and not steps? So the Torah describes the idea of, of, of what do you call it, of modesty, that sort of thing. There's another idea here. When you're ri- going up, when we're trying to rise, raise ourselves up, to reach that altar, to climb as high as we can as Jews, if you climb up steps, you could stop at one level and not move. On a ramp, depending on the angle, of course, but with any imagination, on a ramp, if you stop propelling yourself forward when you're moving up, what happens? You automatically start sliding backwards. That's the nature of the beast. Lech lecha means go, move, accomplish. There's no such thing as remaining at one level. A Jew has to constantly grow. Elemasei B'nai Yisrael. These are the journeys of the B'nai Yisrael. The journeys of the B'nai Yisrael means that the B'nai Yisrael are on the move. The Jewish people, historically, were going to be on the move. Tomorrow we'll see. We'll go through the psukim. We'll see what civilizes it over here. Okay? Yes.